everybody. My name is Gilda Ross. I'm the Glen Bard Student and Community Projects Coordinator. I'm delighted that you could join us. Such a busy time of year. It's a beautiful night, but I'm really glad that you're giving us this hour and you won't be sorry. It is uh, promises to be a fascinating conversation with two of my favorite people, Dr. Karen Natterson, Dr. John Duffy, will be talking with us this evening and I promise you, you will walk away with some things that could change everything. Our ask is always to please share this resource. We have a, quite a, an extraordinary lineup coming up uh, to finish up the year and uh, as we go forward. Um, next week on Tuesday, we will be welcoming Stephen Hill. April is Alcohol Awareness Month. He'll be talking about his book, A Journey to Recovery, about his story. There'll be a panel afterwards to, to, to follow up with some remarks. And then we're all excited about Grown and Flown on May 3rd. Mary Dell Harrington and Lisa Heffernan will be talking about their book, Grown and Flown, How to Support Your Teen, Stay Close as a Family, and Raise Independent Adults. That will be on Tuesday, May 3rd at 7 p.m. So I hope you'll circle your calendar, go to the website, glenbardgps.org. Very soon we'll be listing our programming and I appreciate your sharing this with your neighbor and your relative who lives across the country as well. We thank and are so grateful to our sponsors who make this possible and we couldn't do it without them. So the format tonight, Dr. Natterson will speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll start our conversation. Um, then if you've got questions, please enter them in the Q&A. We'll try to get to them and the chat as time permits. Without further ado, Karen Adderson is a pediatrician, consultant, and award-winning author. A graduate of Harvard College and John Hopkins Medical School, Dr. Nadison's clinical experiences have been extraordinary as she has learned firsthand how difficult it can be for parents to navigate all of the information, good and bad, thrust at them. In her book, Dr. Nadison focuses on the most common fears and misconceptions about pediatric health and wellness issues. A best-selling author, Dr. Nadison feels that working on The Care and Feeding of You, a series for American Girl, has been a career highlight. Her most recent book is Decoding Boys, The New Science Behind the Subtle Art of Raising Sons, in which she explains the intricacies of navigating boys through puberty. She also provides expertise for numerous parenting websites and news sites, including the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the Huff Post. Uh, the Glenbard Parent Series is so delighted to welcome her in conversation with Dr. John Duffy, one of our favorites. He's a highly sought after experienced clinical psychologist, parenting and relationship expert. He's the regular parenting and relationship expert in so many areas in Chicago and well beyond. His latest and very important book is Parenting the New Teen in the Age of Anxiety. We are in for a treat tonight. Dr. Natterson, please start us off. Can't wait. So thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with all of you here. Um, and I'm going to whip through a very quick overview of puberty and what happens during puberty so that we can have a really uh, wonderful conversation about decision-making and relationships in the context of puberty. So just a super quick tour of me. I am a pediatrician. I left the practice of pediatrics to become a full-time writer. And then I eventually became an entrepreneur and it all circles around puberty. Uh, what I do for a living is really try to make puberty comfortable. And over my time doing this, I moved from being a generalist in pediatrics to a specialist in this area that has now stretched, and I'll explain that in a second. And I went from um, speaking in a space that was really talked about in terms of girls to being in a space that is really spoken about in terms of all. Um, just a quick overview of puberty. It lasts a lot longer than it used to. This is not a middle school phenomenon anymore. The history has lots of new normals. So we'll go back to the 1940s and 50s and 60s. This is a picture um, from the book, The Caring and Keeping of You. Um, and it shows what are called Tanner stages, which are the five stages of breast development. Um, Dr. Tanner is a, a researcher who in the 1940s, 50s and 60s went into orphanages in the UK 
and took pictures of kids to document their pubertal development and to stage it. And in doing so, he was able to establish the time for onset to puberty for both girls and boys. And he did so using breast development, uh, penile growth and testicular development, and um, pubic hair growth. He used those markers, but he only ever took pictures. What he established is that kids went into puberty sometime between the ages of 11 and 12. Stage one in this little cartoon here is prepubescent, stage five is fully adult, and stages two, three, and four are the progression through puberty. In 1997, though, a woman named Marsha Herman Giddens, who's a nurse practitioner in North Carolina, had been noticing this trend where girls were coming into her office and they were entering puberty much younger. And she didn't understand it and she decided to study it. So she reached out to the American Academy of Pediatrics who supported her in studying 17,000 girls. And what she documented in this 1997 article and what made headlines all over was that in fact, girls were going into puberty one to one and a half years earlier than Tanner had predicted. So instead of 11 to 11 and a half, it was more like 10, uh, maybe even nine and a half. She did not look at boys. In 2010, an article came out describing a study done by a woman who I actually know very well. Her name is Louise Greenspan. She was part of a team of researchers across the country. She runs the Kaiser Northern California puberty studies. And these are a very famous uh, group of studies that have been done for now many years. Um, but she was the only pediatrician in the group. And uh, what she and her colleagues discovered was they were going back to kind of see if Herman Giddens data could be replicable, right? It wasn't really true what Herman Giddens had said. And what they found was not only is it true, but puberty is happening even earlier. So this is 12 years ago now that the data came out that it was considered normal for girls to enter puberty between the ages of seven and eight. And it was really um, divided into, the data was divided into three different racial groups. There were black children studied, white children studied, and Hispanic children studied. That's very limited. And I'm using the language that they used in the study, but it's very limited, right? It, there was um, there were no other ethnicity studies and there were no other, um, there were no multiracial groups studied. And so, but what we had here was data showing that it was completely normal. And when I say completely normal, breast budding, which is one of the earliest signs of puberty was seen in 23% of seven-year-old black girls in 10% of white girls. When you look at eight-year-olds, it was up to 43% of black girls, 31% of Hispanic girls and 18% of white girls. So this was not an outlier phenomenon. It was quite real. By 2012, Marsha Herman Giddens, who had retired, was frustrated by the fact that there was no more data about boys. No one was looking at boys. So she did. She looked at 4,000 boys and what she found was the exact same thing. She found they were entering puberty younger as well, depending upon their race. Again, looked at the same three groups. She determined that the average age of onset was much closer to nine or 10 with and if you have to digest these numbers for a second, I'm oh, sorry about that. Um, you have to digest these numbers for a second, but um, the boys were 43% um, of black nine-year-old boys were entering puberty, okay? 44% of Hispanic boys and 26% of nine-year-old white boys. So this is not an outlier phenomenon. What is puberty? What does it look like? Okay, here we go. In XX bodies, so bodies that have two X chromosomes, estrogen dominates the process of puberty. So there are signals from the brain that go to the ovaries that tell the ovaries to make estrogen and estrogen in turn makes the body shift and change and matures the female um, sex organs. So the first things that you will usually see are breast development and mood swings. There's no particular order to puberty, which is one of its cruelties but you also see shifts in body shape, um, curves appearing, hip widening, voice changes. Of course, girls get their period, although this is much further into the path of puberty than it ever was before. Um, the average age of periods beginning has not really budged that much. It's still around 12 and a half. And so remember a generation or two ago, girls would enter puberty at 11, they'd get their period at 12 and a half. Now girls are entering puberty at seven or eight or nine and getting their period at 12 and a half. So this is a much longer, slower process. 
And of course, estrogen impacts the growth spurt. In bodies with an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, it's testosterone that dominates the, the path through puberty. And same thing, you have signaling from the brain that goes to the testicles, which are the testosterone manufacturing units in the body. And testosterone in turn makes the testicles and the penis grow. And frankly, for the first couple of years of boy puberty, that's all that happens. So the later changes in boy puberty, like increasing lean muscle mass and vocal changes and wet dreams and growth spurts, they're not visible at first. And because so many boys go into a private stage of life as they start having testosterone on board, oftentimes people are unaware that their sons are in puberty. A couple of really big side notes. The first is hormones circulate above the neck, not just below the neck, which means they impact the way the brain works. And we'll talk about that in a sec. And it's really important to know this, that hair, acne, and body odor are on a separate path. These three changes are caused by what are called the adrenal androgens. They come from your adrenal glands on top of your kidney instead of by estrogen or testosterone. And so it can be confusing because Tanner looked at hair and he uses hair to stage puberty. And a lot of people who see hair growth on their kids think my child is in puberty because I see some pubic hair or I see some hair under the arms. But in fact, the adrenal androgens do not mature the sex organs. All they do is cause hair to grow and they cause the, the sweat glands to produce more sweat and they cause the oil glands to produce more oil. And that's what gives you acne and body odor. Now I promised you a second on brain development. So here you go. The brain develops very slowly and steadily through life in a very rational order. It, it matures from the bottom to the top and from the inside out. And I know I'm not the first speaker to come and describe this, but I'm going to remind you that the part of the brain that is mature in middle school and high school, all the way through college. And unlike this slide, this slides depiction, which shows this ending at 20, it's more like 25 or 30. The part of the brain that dominates its most mature is the middlemost part of the brain, the limbic system, which is the emotional part of the brain, the part of the brain that responds to risk reward challenges, the part of the brain that seeks thrills. And everyone, demonizes this part of the brain, but it shouldn't be demonized. You can be motivated in very positive ways and not just negative ways. You can get an A on a math test and feel completely motivated to study really hard for the next math test. So the fact that the limbic system is very emotionally uh, connected and works in this motivational way is not a bad thing. It's just a tween, teen, and 20-something thing. By the time kids are in their mid to late 20s, that's when the prefrontal cortex matures. That's when the part of the brain that's all the way at the tippy top and on the outside is able to send and receive messages as quickly as the limbic system. And what that means is that's when most people are able to balance this risk reward part of their brain with the rational thinking consequential part of their brain. Now, what I said a slide before, that hormones don't circulate just below the neck. Here's your toxic stew of puberty, right? You have a a partially mature brain where the part that can fire the fastest is the emotional part. And you have peaks and troughs of these hormones, estrogen or progesterone or testosterone, all these puberty related hormones. And the whole combination can feel very difficult for kids to manage. That is what we see when we see moods in pubescent kids. And all of this ladders up to consequences in terms of their communication and their decision-making. So when you combine the limbic system being dominant with these hormonal surges, with feelings about their new bodies, and remember, none of us have any idea where their bodies are gonna land in the future. So when they have questions about how tall am I gonna be, or am I gonna have a huge crop of acne, or am I gonna lose my hair as an adult, or all of these questions about how they're gonna look, none of us know they don't know, and they have feelings about it, and they feel very much in transition. So you've got that in the context of all these other things going on in the body, and then you've got social shifts, right, which we know to be so true, um, and there are certainly social shifts that happen as young as grade school, but the classic social shifts happen through middle 
and high school as kids, um, you know, they're tapping into that limbic system. They're making choices about how they behave. They're, they're leaning into their desire to take risks. And all of that combines to create some predictable patterns. So I want to teach you just three more minutes on what you can expect to see in kids who are in puberty and how to best manage it. So one thing you can expect is that peers will have a bigger influence than adults. And that is actually chemical. When, when we do studies and we actually look at kids around their peers or with peer influence, even on social media versus around adults, what we see is that the limbic system lights up much more when peers are around. So peers drive that risk reward, which is why your child might say one thing to you at the dinner table, they really mean it when they say they're gonna to go to that party and they're not gonna have a drink. But then when they go to the party and there are kids around, a different part of their brain lights up and they make a different kind of decision. So that's one predictable pattern. The second predictable pattern is that mood coins have two sides. So for instance, the classic description of a pubescent male, and it might not be fair, but it's a stereotype, is that they tend to be rageful or they have moments of real anger. But what we know to be true as adults who have been around boys this age is that they also go quiet. So there are balances to the mood swings. You know, a child who is very moody and crying a lot is often also a ch child who is laughing a lot and has the giggles and is silly. There are two sides to this mood coin. Now, COVID threw a wrench in mental health, a big wrench, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second. The third predictable pattern is that there will be heat. And what I mean by that is that as kids are grappling with all of these variables, it's, it heats up the situation and they take it out on the people who make them feel safest. So there will be conflict, especially with the adults in their lives. And in my opinion, the best way to resolve that conflict is to let the heat cool before engaging a kid in the conversation. All of this means relationships will shift. And in the friend group, the shift tends to move from the grammar school, I have a bunch of friends, to this amorphous because it might happen in middle school and it might happen in high school and it might not happen until college where some kids start to have bigger feelings and they want someone to be more than friends or they decide they don't want someone to be a friend or they want a friend with benefits, right? Or they enter a relationship with boyfriends or girlfriends. And so just that alone in their social sphere is complicated enough because for each child, all of those things are shifting and changing and every child is at different places at any given time. Each kid is on their own trajectory through relationship shifting. And of course, there's family relationship shifting as well. So I'm going to wrap by just sharing a couple of guaranteed scenarios, and then we can get into conversation around this. One of them is that you will face a slamming door. Sometimes it slams, sometimes it shuts quietly, but all kids, independent of their gender, will shut us out from time to time. And while that is completely normal, it doesn't mean that it is something that we should totally accept. And so I am a big fan of having lots of conversations with kids. And sometimes what that means is sitting on the other side of that closed door, literally sitting on the other side of that closed door and saying, I'm here and I'm available if you wanna talk about it. It does not mean a lecture. It does not mean you're constantly coming at your kid like I'm coming at you right now going 100 miles an hour. That's not effective. But starting and engaging them in the conversation, even when they shut you out, is extremely important. Another guaranteed scenario is that they will have mood swings, all of them, okay? Some swing greater in greater directions than others, but all of them will have mood swings and sometimes it can feel like a right hook. Sometimes it can come out of nowhere. And you just need to anticipate it and you have to come up with some cool down strategies that work for you and that work for the kid. And by the way, kids should have ownership over those strategies because when adults tell them how to cool down, often it turns the heat up. The third guaranteed scenario is the silent treatment. It's not the slamming door, but it's the silent treatment where you will get no interaction. This 
tends to be a little bit more gendered. I know lots of girls who do this. However, it tends to be a very typical feature of male puberty. And the way I recommend parents handle it or adults in these boys handle it is to respect their communication style, but to let them know when words, whether they're spoken or written, will help you. And we can talk a little bit about that. The fourth guaranteed scenario is split loyalties. What I mean by that is relationship shift and kids will, I promise you, they will feel split between their loyalty to the adults in their lives and their loyalty to their friends. And sometimes this drives bad decisions, especially when they lie to protect themselves or their friends. And so the most important thing that you can do for kids at this juncture is to say to them that it is their safety that comes first. Because your only job is to keep them safe and healthy. That's really your job. And so when they lie and put themselves or other people at risk, it puts them at jeopardy. So you want to be very, very clear about how you can help them ensure their own safety. And finally, all the misses, the misquoting, misinterpretation, misunderstanding, and mistakes. There will be a lot of this. My best advice to you is to use clear language with your kids. If you're talking about body parts, use the anatomical terms. If you're talking about feelings, define the feelings. Always check in with your kid and make sure you're understanding each other. Because the hardest thing is when you finally get into conversation about something that feels really big, only to realize that you're actually not talking about the same thing. Now, of course, COVID threw a big wrench into all of this um, and really shifted a lot of these scenarios and took a tremendous toll on the mental health of kids. And so I'm going to end here and hopefully we'll cover that in our conversation. Welcome, Dr. Duffy. Take it away, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Natterson, thank you so much for um a whole host of really, really useful, important information. A lot of it, I think a lot of us are not aware of. First, I want to thank you for like the approaches to the guaranteed scenarios um, that are workable, that parents can like kind of take note of and put to work like tonight, like really, really useful. But if you're okay with it, I would love to go back to the beginning for a second. Sure. You're, you're, you were talking about young kids who are hitting puberty earlier than we would ever think. And in my research for my latest book, not from a, um, a, a medical perspective, from a clinical perspective, I found the same thing. And my theory in part was, oh, kids are exposed to so much data and information at such young ages. That's part of why they seem pubescent at earlier and earlier ages and why we need to approach our kids in that way. Is there some, to your thinking, is there some combination approach there that parents can use so that they can work effectively with their younger kids and talk to them effectively, yeah. even if it's uncomfortable, even if it feels like I shouldn't talk to my nine-year-old this way, but I think I have to. It's such a great question. So I think there are three legs to this stool. And one is that physically it's happening earlier. Biologically, it's happening earlier. The second is exactly as you've described, information is happening earlier. So what I mean by that is they are seeing things and hearing things, the likes of which no child their age heard a generation ago. There is exposure to a whole host of things that they are just not developmentally ready for, right? So that's a, that's a big leg to the school. And then the third thing is because they look older, than their brain really is. And they are receiving information about things that they're not ready for. The world treats them as if they're older. And the world expects our little eight and nine and 10 year old kids to be able to answer things or do things in a way that they cannot. Their brain is not there, which is why I love that picture of brain development, which is so old and so gritty and grainy and it's been around forever, but it sort of proves the point. The brain is on its own path. And the brain takes time to develop. So what do you do in a world where your kid's not ready for the information, but there is the, there it is. They've heard it. They've, you know, you can fill in the blank, what they've seen or what the music lyrics are, you know, there are a hundred scenarios. And what I tell parents is, so the, the first piece of advice I'm going to give you is this. 
my biggest parenting mistake, and I make it every single time, is I go to a talk or I read a book or I listen to a podcast and I'm so, it's in my head and I'm so in the zone that when I finish that piece of content, I dump it all on my kids immediately and I just want to fix it all right now. So don't do that. So what we're going to talk about, you want to pace with your kids and it requires pulling back a little bit and, and just going slowly, okay? If you have a grade school or a middle school age kid in your house and you know they are getting information that they are not ready for, the very first thing you can and should do is simply say that. All you need to say is, I was at this talk and it got me thinking, I think you're getting a lot of information about a lot of things and I'm not sure you're ready for all of it. And you know what? We're gonna spend the next many years having conversations about this stuff but as things come up, I'm gonna get better about asking you what you know and where you are. And you're never in trouble for having seen something or read something or opened something online that you then think it's not gonna be okay with my parent or guardian or whoever it is. If you lay that groundwork, you're good because you can keep going back and you can keep approaching. It's like whack-a-mole with these issues, right? Yes. So that's the foundation I would lay. I love that. I think I wanna pause on it for a second for those <laughs> for parents who are listening, that you're giving them permission, right? To, um, you, you don't have to have all the answers when your child is eight or nine and you do get to put the pause button on, not get them in trouble for what they've seen, but say, we'll talk about that when you are ready to talk about that. Yep. No small thing, kind of an enormous part of doing what I think really confounds and ties parents up with their younger kids. So as our kids then get deeper into puberty and adolescence, um, how do you envision kind of opening up those discussions? Because, you know, I work with kids who are not much older than that, who are asking about like, you know, about the specifics in the Ukraine or about sex specifically or drugs or things that we absolutely would not want to talk to our kids about. Is there a way to address those things sure. without yeah. kicking them down, down the road? Right. Because you don't want to kick everything down the road because <laughs> at the end of the day, they are information seekers. And if you are not giving them the information, they're going to get it from someone else. Right. And sometimes, you know, they're, they're going to hear about the tooth fairy on the school bus. I mean, this is not a new concept that if it, it, if it doesn't come from you, it, it comes from somewhere. And so a couple of pieces of advice here. The first is for anyone who feels they have given their kid access to a device too soon, just take a do-over. Just say, you know what? I messed that one up. I'm going to pull that back. And it's not about giving them their own phone. It's about access to devices these days. If they have a login, if they've got your iPad or your computer, that there's no difference between that and, and buying them a phone. It's all the same and it's all interchangeable. Because if you're trying to pace how your kids learn about the world, the best way to mess that up is to give them access to the whole world at their fingertips. And I'm not suggesting that parents sort of keep their kids in a bubble because I don't think that's helpful either. But I do think that this can get paced over time. And you can explain to your kids that you want to be their source of information until you're ready to relinquish that role to other people and share that role with them. As we get into trickier topics, and it can be war and it can be sex, I mean, there's a whole world of tricky topics here. Don't try to take it all in one conversation. I can promise you, you will lose your kid quickly. You're going to lose your kid quickly anyways. So watch them, engage with them, let them do the talking, right? Ask them a question and actually listen to what they say. They will let you know where they're at. And then you can kind of push the conversation as far as you're comfortable at a given time. And either if they're done or if you're done, you get to come back to the conversation another time. So this is, you know, I think people were really relieved by the idea of the talk when, you know, when I was growing up, there was no such thing anymore. There are thousands of talks and, and this is what parenting is now. And so just 
pace it. And I think the war is a great example where you need to know where your kid is. You need to know what they know. And then you can determine in your own home what feels right and how you're going to approach some of these issues. And I, I liked your talk about brain science. I know we've seen those, some of those uh, graphics before, but they're really important because you're right. The kids now, they work in sound bites, right? I mean, so the idea of sitting down and saying, we're going to have the talk and we're going to cover a number of these items in the talk, as opposed to like, we're going to work like you text. We're going to, we're going to work in little sound bites and, you know, um, you'll be able to digest it and you'll know that the discomfort will be over soon. Um, right. I, I encourage parents to use the uh, pause button on the TV, just to you know, like, all right, we're gonna have an uncomfortable sex talk for a minute. That's right, it's a, it's a teachable moment, right? Grab your teachable moments. If you are walking down the street and you see something and you think, I gotta have that conversation with my kid. If your kid is sitting right there, that is a great time to have that conversation with your kid, right? It is the rare teachable moment that you shouldn't grab. Yes. So, okay, so um, so this is fun because as I'm, uh, I'm gonna be using a lot of this in my practice. So earlier today, I was working with a couple and they have the kid who is up in the room, he's got his door closed, he is in his mid-teens um, and he is giving them nothing to work with, earbuds are in, there's a screen in front of him 95% of the time. And their question to me consistently is, how do we even get his attention? How do we get him to talk to us at all? Like even at the dinner table, he comes, he goes, he doesn't say a word. Yeah, it's very tricky. And, you know, I can give you some general advice, but I will say that every answer really depends upon the personalities of the kids and the adults in the home and what the dynamics are. So I'm going to give you an answer in a bubble. But if someone who's listening says, Oh, that's completely not reasonable because in my home, there are four children and they're running around all the time, right? Or that's completely unreasonable because I'm a single parent and I don't have someone to bounce it off of. There's so many scenarios in which the ideal scenario doesn't work, but some, some sort of baseline bullet points here. One is um, you, you own the earbuds and you own the computer. And I think that conversation about sort of the, that ownership piece and understanding that, that when you handed these things to your child, that you weren't giving them without rules. You were giving them with an implicit understanding and that implicit understanding is obviously different on both sides. I think it's a fair place to start. I also, I always ask kids, if you were the parent, how would you deal with this situation? Because I think often when you have someone who is in his room, with the door shut, with the earbuds on all the time, with the screen, and you ask that child, how does it feel? You'd be surprised. Most of them will say, I don't, I don't love this. I mean, I love gaming with my friends, but I don't want to be here seven hours a day or 18 hours a day or however long. That I would love to engage, but my family's out there doing stuff I don't like. Or And they'll give you a list of things, a list of reasons why that time span increased and why the door was increasingly closed. So it doesn't have to be confrontational. In fact, that doesn't really help. I generally feel that if you start by asking the kid and sort of saying, listen, we got a level set because this isn't working for me. And then you ask, tell me about how you feel here. You can often roll back the current situation, not as quickly as you want, but slowly and authentically, right? Yeah. So then when the kid says, well, if there was anything I was ever interested in doing with the rest of the family, I would do it. What are you interested in doing? And then make an effort, right? Which is hard because who has time? But this is, this is your child, as far as I'm concerned, yelling, help me out, get me out of this room. COVID made this really hard. COVID taught our kids a lot of bad habits about screen time, but screens also saved our kids in COVID, oh, right? Yeah. And so this is very, very tricky. And I think it's as hard as it was to be in it for many families and every family is different in this. I think right now, there's a whole different group of families who are really struggling with how do I shift that balance because it's a year later and it's really time to come out of the room and it's really time to start engaging with people and my child can't. So uh, for those parents, you need extra help. You need a little bit of help from a mental health professional. 
And there's no shame in that, right? I mean, that's part of, that's a big part of what you're saying here. None. No, and, and I will tell you, the kids feel no shame. The kids see mental health care as part of health care. We all have to just let go of any shame that we have as a generation of parents because the kids do not feel it. Mental health has been completely normalized for their generation, which is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Oh, it's amazing, right. Uh, yeah, kids, recently I had um, a, a teenage girl dropped off at my office by her friends. That's how they're, they're kind of like, oh, I'm going to see my therapist, no big deal. It's like, ah, oh, it's Tuesday, the sky's blue. They, they do not judge it. So we need to take cues from them. I love that. And I like the idea. Um, I, I work with far too many parents who get angry with their kids for being kind of unapproachable, unavailable, as opposed to being curious about that, recognizing mm, you're probably not living your ideal best life. You're not, probably not enjoying every moment in your room. Let me ask you a few questions that are not accusatory. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's really easy for us to sit here and say that. I have a 16-year-old son living in my house. I know what it is to be so frustrated by the silence. And you take it personally. You think, you go through this whole thing, what did I do? And then you get frustrated with the lack of what you perceive as lack of gratitude or lack of, and really, it may have nothing to do with you. But it is okay in a moment of good times to kind of hold a mirror up and say, hey, that thing from yesterday where your door was shut all day, that makes me feel bad. And you could just share it. You could just say, I just want you to know when you do that, this is how I feel. I'll always tell you, I would love for you to tell me how you feel. And I think that helps. I, th I think that helps us shed our own, you know, judgments and, and sort of vulnerabilities around it. Right. And probably draws a little empathy and kind of respect for that child's point of view. Like I have enough respect for you to tell you how I feel, right? You know, I know that you can handle this and you can adapt your behavior. That's right. Which leads me to a, another question. So um, you talk a lot about decision-making in your work and, and you know, um, how that develops. And as parents, I think we, we get anxious about all the perils, right? All the pitfalls that are waiting outside our door for our kids, right? If we don't lecture, if we don't tell them, you have to avoid this and this and this, and here's what could happen. And that could be laced with something and, you know, all yeah. these things, right? Uh, is there a better way to approach our kids as they're heading out there in the world and somehow still have some impact on that decision-making? So I'm just going to say that every fear that every parent has is legitimate about whatever it's about, right? It comes from, sometimes it comes from a personal history, but sometimes it just comes from simple straight up fact. So fentanyl is terrifying. It's yeah. terrifying. And so we're, you know, all of us were anxious enough about having conversations around drugs and alcohol with our kids to begin with. And now there's fentanyl out there, right? So the stakes always feel like they're higher and higher. And, and yet, we just have to go to the teenage brain and we have to stop and think, how can my words get embedded into that brain in such a way that my child is gonna make a better decision? Okay, so here's what I wanna teach you about the brain. Because of the order of operations of maturity, because the brain matures from the bottom to the top and from the inside out, we know that it literally takes 3,000 times longer for a signal to ping around the limbic system compared to that signal going to the prefrontal cortex to make a smart decision, okay? 3,000 times sounds like a lot, but it's, these That's are- That's alarming. <laughs> okay, so it's quick, but it's still, it's 3,000 times faster. So the best parenting tip I can give you for yourself and to pass on to your child or to the kid in your life is to count to 10. Literally give your brain time before you make a choice. If kids begin to understand, and there are so many great books and videos out there about brain development. I do a podcast. We do a whole episode that teenagers can listen to. If kids understand how decision-making actually works in their brain, and they understand that by giving their brain time, 
the prefrontal cortex, which does exist, gets the signal and can make the good choice, then they also understand that you trust them to make the good choice, which is so much of it. That's when your words are in their head. When you've given them the tool, which is wait, let the signal be sent, then be proactive and make the choice. Now, sometimes they're gonna make the wrong choice. Mm -hmm. That's the reality, right? Because another thing that is not yet fully mature is their ability to really kind of send the, their neuronal pathways in the right direction and get the electrical signaling working so they're always doing the right thing, right? We know that. We were also teenagers and young adults. But for those of you who know the child who always seems to make the right decision, that child just gives their brain time. That child just weighs the consequences where other kids don't. And by the way, that's a burden to be that child. It's hard to be the child who's always the one making the better decisions. But if, if you can take nothing else from this talk, the thing you can go home and just dump on your kid or when you turn the screen off, just dump on your kid is, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Let's just try this. Just try counting and just see how it feels and then come back and tell me. And adults should do it too. It's amazing. I was gonna say modeling could play a really powerful oh, role here, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I currently have kids count to five. I now realize they're, they're, we're still in the limbic system. I'm going to make them count to 10 now. So Depends I love how quickly they count. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, talk to me a little bit about relationships. And, you know, so once they're out the door, right, and they're engaging in these peer relationships, which for so many kids that I know are, they, they carry so much weight. You're right. They carry more weight than the relationship with mom and dad in so many ways. They play so heavily into their sense of self-worth and self-esteem. Yeah. And um, how do we guide them into, you know, like managing those relationships, managing some of the disappointments they're inevitably gonna run into um, and, and some of those like more intimate relationships that thrill them. So this is easy advice to give and hard advice to take. And I've been on the taking end as well. But the more your child can talk to you or someone else who you trust about the nature of their relationships, the safer that child is. So we know there are heartaches out there. We know there are friendships that are going to get um, enmeshed in conflict and some are gonna survive the conflict and you know, some relationships will not survive the conflict. Um, we know that just in this moment of puberty, there are kids who go through it seemingly with, without a hiccup. Grass is always greener, but it seems like there's no hiccup for that kid. And you might have a child in your life who has every struggle in the world around physical development or isn't growing or changing at all when everyone else is. So there's so many ways in which we know that these relationships are going to be challenged. And Talking it through is the savior for many kids, mostly because when kids begin to realize that not only is it not exclusive to them, that this is a very normal experience, but also that there are solutions and that someone from the outside can sometimes shine a light and give them a solution that they hadn't thought of. Um, it's, it's a great relief. Now, when I say this, what I don't mean is don't make the conversation about you. Your kids are not interested in your puberty or your friendships. I mean, sometimes they are and they'll ask questions, but most of the time they're not. They're actually really interested in their experience. And so there's this balance there, which is why I say it doesn't have to be you. It can be an older cousin who you know is going to give them good advice or a close family friend or a godparent or a therapist or a school counselor or a healthcare provider, or a religious figure. There are so many people in their life. And one of the best things that parents can do is sit with their kids and talk about who the person is. Who's the surrogate to me? If you have a question you can't ask me, which is totally fine, who are you gonna go to? And the reason I give that advice is I have been that person. I have been assigned to be the surrogate. And it was really great that I knew because one of the calls I got was 
a, a young woman who was in her 20s, actually, was dating a guy, it was a new relationship. She wasn't feeling super comfortable. She was in the bathroom, right? They were in an apartment. She was in, calling me from the bathroom to ask me my advice. And I was so glad that her mom had flagged me and said, you're the person. If she can't call me in a situation, she's going to call you. Because then I could say, oh, what do you want me to say? <laughs> what, are you, what are you looking for here? And so I, I knew how to answer in a way that respected how her mom would feel. And so find your surrogate. It really makes, and it might be more than one person. It might be one person for this thing and one person for this thing. And that is absolutely fine. This is a huge point really, isn't it? Because um, I think about the kids I work with and they often have several surrogates that they can talk to. They're a little more comfortable talking to the mom or dad. Sometimes mom or dad are both around the outs a little bit. And I remember when my son was in high school, um, he was on the swim team. And I remember thinking, oh, he's never gonna get up at 4.30 in the morning and get in the pool. And the coach took me aside and said, trust me, let me do it for a while, let me, and he was, he was my son's surrogate for four years okay. and made him stronger. And sometimes I think we can outsource those things that we, because we want our kids to be safe and comfortable and happy and cozy, we don't always challenge them the way they need to be challenged. I never would have done that. And, you know, right. he's a better man for it. So, you know, I That's love right. that idea. That's right. And sometimes they can take it, a piece of advice from someone else that they, they simply cannot take from you as the parent. And that's, that's fine. It's really fine. It's really especially fine if you have a conversation with that person and say, this is what I'm hoping for. And by the way, that person, maybe it's a coach might say, that's a really bad idea and here's why. So they may be able to shine, be able to shine some light for you as to sort of where, right? Cause we're all making this up as we go along, right? Isn't that of course. the bottom line? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that's why I love uh, the, the, the vibe that you're giving. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, you, I, I, it really is useful because it's kind of like you you can screw this up and you can yes. come back to it and say, you know what? I screwed that up. Um, you know, we're going to we're going to do a do over here. In fact, I will double down on that and say it is when you tell your kids that you have screwed it up, that you will win them 10 times over. When you acknowledge your faults, you're not begging them for forgiveness. You're not saying you're wrong all the time. But when you say, oh man, I got that one so wrong. Your kids will laugh with you. They will tell you, you got it wrong. And it will bring them closer. They will be more willing because we tell kids all the time that failure is important. If we're not willing to fail as parents, we are not modeling that behavior, right? Ugh, amen to that. Yes. And I think too often for fear that they'll repeat our mistakes or that if we share a story with them, we're giving them tacit permission to misbehave or something. That's, that's right. That's right. right. <laughs> we, we, we then hold back and we're then putting th this idea forth that we were perfect. Right. We were so perfect. that's a classic one. Um, they ask a hundred percent of all kids ask the adults in their lives about sex and about drugs. So if you have not been asked yet, okay, just prepare your answer because you will be asked, right? And it's the drug question that really throws parents for a loop because they don't know how to answer. And many people will come to me and say, if I tell them the truth, I feel like it's giving them permission. And so there are lots of ways to have that conversation, including starting with that. I'm going to tell you the truth but it is not permission for you to do it. Here's why. Here's how drugs have changed. Here's what I know about your brain. Here's like, tell them, be honest. By the way, as soon as they figured out you've lied to them, you've lost them. You have to work really hard to get them back. So. Oh, brilliant. Yes. Um, I, I kind of want to hear your thoughts about the lonely child. You know, um, you know, I, 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 I work with so many parents whose hearts just break. And um, I think sometimes in, in an effort to do the very best thing and to make them feel better, they'll say, oh, you know, you're smart and you're beautiful and you're fun and you're funny. And if those people don't want to hang out with you, that's their problem and put it on the other kids. And, um, and there your child sits alone another day. Um, and so many kids, especially I think in the wake of COVID, 
find like, boy, socially, I don't know if I still have it. Even if I had it before, I'm not connecting the way I used to. So um, I think it's important for adults to recognize that there are two kinds of lonely. There's, I think this child is lonely and I know this child is lonely. So the, I think this child is lonely is oftentimes this child is on their phone all the time. This child is, and they're actually not lonely. They're engaging. They're very social. They're gaming with their friends or they're on social media with their friends or they're texting, right? They're talking. So I think we have to separate the two groups because um, sometimes our perception of what loneliness looks like and theirs is very different. What you're talking about is the child who, who is lonely, who is isolated from other kids, who might be left to eat alone every day at school and, and who has not built a peer group. And for that family dealing with a child who's in that position, uh, I'll say a couple of things. The first is, this is a hard piece of advice, but it is true because it doesn't feel true, but it is true. It only takes one. It only takes one other kid, one connection to go from being truly lonely to feeling connected. And so I think sometimes parents think the solution is to throw in with a large group. And it, depending upon what the drivers are and what's going on for that individual child, sometimes that's the opposite of the right solution. The other thing is, especially as you have kids who are into middle school and above, grammar school is a little different, but um, you can't choose their friends. You want to so badly. And by the way, you know you're right, right? Like I, I always used to see these kids and go, oh, I know that is a great kid. You're, you can't, for, they're, if you pick them, they're not interested in who you pick. And if you pick them for a child who's truly isolated and lonely, that is patronizing in a way that really makes it harder for your child. So how do you help that child? I, I think post-COVID, this really requires teamwork. It requires engaging the school. To, these are people who have eyes on your kid during the day you don't. And these are people who can actually make the magic happen because they understand what's happening for all these kids. They're looking at a 30,000 foot view. Engage the school, let them help you. That will be huge. Um, if that's not working or if you're feeling lost at the school, if your child has any outside school interest at all, engage there. But again, it's not just plunk your kid in the middle. It's, you know, if, if you have a kid who loves soccer and they're very isolated and they're always alone on the field, pick up the phone and call the coach and just say, this is what I'm seeing. But don't helicopter the relationship. You, I do think you have to get out of there in order for your child to be able to feel that they can connect because there's a lot of shame associated with loneliness. And what I see is that it is very normal for kids to get quiet. It's very normal for kids to get loud at puberty, but it's very normal for kids to get quiet. It's very normal for kids to withdraw from adults. They left to their own devices with some other adult support. They often do really well just finding that one connection. But when we hover and helicopter, they're trying to manage our feelings around it. Yeah. And that is not helpful to them. Oh, amen to that. And I, and I love your thought that it only takes one, um, that one good connection really does carry a kid. And, you know, so you don't have to broker this, the, this massive play group or, you know, um, the get, getting into the orchestra, if you have no interest in that, you know, um, I, I, I love that. And I like the idea of stepping back when it's time to step back, that you do not micromanage this. This is theirs from, from the time they start connecting. Yeah. Now I will say, and, and um, you know, this is your purview more than mine, but if you've got a child who needs to talk to someone and you think they're struggling with their mental health, it is not a yes, no question for your child. I do not believe in posing that as, would you like to talk to someone? I think there are many times where you can use that question, but if you think that your child's really struggling, it's, you need to talk to someone. Let's talk about how we go about finding the right person together. Um, because some of this isolation and loneliness really does need professional help. I agree with you. I, um, I had the luxury of listening to your earlier talk, so I'm going to borrow from it. That I think there are, there are very few non-negotiables in parenting. This is one of them. And to your point earlier, this is never a bad idea. 
like even if you're if you if you're misfiring a little bit, even if your kid isn't suffering to the degree yeah. you think he or she might be, yeah. it's never a bad idea. And kids um, with the right connection always walk away with something useful. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, I, I see we don't have a lot of time left, but you you mentioned the heat, and I, I would love to hear you talk just for a moment about how we can manage the heat because this is probably the thing I'm asked about most is like you know, and and we'll lock horns with our kids. I used to do this when my son was younger. We'll spend an hour and a half yelling about the same thing, yelling about the same thing, thinking like, if I yell louder, I think I win this, you know, knowing yeah. full well, that's not true. And I hope people feel better that you do it and I do it. So, <laughs> I mean, even when you do this work all day, every day, you it happens. It's We have these buttons that stick out so far and our kids just know how to go boop, 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 and they, they understand it, right? Um, conflict is not a bad thing in and of itself. It's just, it, it's just not sustainable and it's not healthy when it escalates to a certain degree. But see, not seeing eye to eye is part of them individuating. Part of their job in that transition through middle school and definitely in that tr transition out the second half of high school is to decide that they are going to be a whole bunch of things that we are not. That is how they launch. That they're, how are kids supposed to leave the house and be independent if all they want to do is be carbon copies of the people who live in the house with them? That is not a success strategy for them. And so it is their job. I think it is their job. And biologically, it seems that the limbic system being dominant reinforces this theory. It is their job to seek thrills and to push the boundaries a little bit and to be motivated by all sorts of different things. And so what gets me going, like cleaning the garage, does not get my kids going. We are motivated by different things. And that is normal and that is appropriate. The heat comes when there are things that are not okay, that don't fly in your house. So very simple example, um, you may have responsibilities that your kids are expected to do. In my house, it's like you set the table, you clear the table, you bring the garbage cans in on garbage day. You know, there's some sort of a list of time. And they've been expected to do it for so many years. It's not like there's a list anywhere. They just know, right? So where is the heat? Every Tuesday afternoon when they drive up the driveway right past those garbage cans and they pretend to not notice them. And then I have to ask them to go get, right? Why, why engage in conflict there? We don't need to, right? So the only time I engage in conflict there is when it's about something else. It's not about the garbage cans. It's about whatever else is going on in their life that I have, I feel that they're not being responsive to. So dissipate the heat on the simple things, right? Um, don't engage in battle over things that are really easy, low hanging fruit. There are ways to communicate with your kid that don't involve actually talking to them. And for those, those simple little things, a text is a conflict avoidant way of saying, go bring the garbage cans in. You could do it with a happy face, you could do it however you want, but that saves you the heat there because there will be conflict about other things. And what you don't want is so much conflict that your kids feel exhausted by being at home or unsafe being at home. It, it needs to be a safe place. It needs to be a place where they can talk, not yell, right? Yes, and I, and I like that idea of a text where you know uh, an hour long argument, it would be wholly unnecessary, um, really, really useful. Years ago, I saw John Gottman, who is a, um, an intimate relationship expert speak. And he said, if you're in conflict, try to cut out 75% of the words you intend to say. <laughs> and then there you're you probably in the, in, the, in the zone that's pretty close. And uh, that okay. gives your limbic system maybe a moment to, to heat up and think it through a little bit. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a universal issue. And I think I've heard from parents whose kids do not turn up the heat that they're worried about that too. Um, and I understand that. 
right? Because sometimes you think something is so predictable and if you have, so um, the flip side is also true. Don't, you don't have to engage your kid in heat, but you, you can, if your child is completely compliant with everything, maybe push them a little, maybe step up what you expect them to do, their responsibilities, push them, especially post COVID, a little bit outside of the nest so that they are forced to individuate a little bit and they are forced to see the world outside of you. Um, this, this pandemic has really, really impacted kids so profoundly and depending upon their age and stage, it's done different things to different kids. But I do think for our high schoolers in particular, um, some of them are gonna need a little bit more of that nudging. That, that's probably the biggest issue I'm dealing with these days is the shift from inertia to movement of some kind, right? And just moving their bodies and uh, connecting with other kids and getting out of bed, literally, where I, you know, a year ago, I was doing sessions with kids who were in bed, in, at school in bed, you know, like, and so the, the shift for them is, first of all, bizarre, um, but it's a difficult one to make, for sure. That's right. That's yeah. right. And they require, it requires our patience as much as anything. Well, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. We're hearing that from the teachers as well. I think if we had teachers to coming to this chat, they would say, "Please, dear experts, give us some some advice, some some something, some takeaways for us." We're hearing from coaches. We're hearing it from teachers. Yeah. Um, parting words, Kara. What what do you want to leave us with tonight? Um, it's never one talk. It this the process of helping to raise kids, whether they're yours or someone else's involves hundreds of teeny tiny conversations, not all of which you will do in a way that thrills you. So take the do over on them, but have them because that's how you show love. Beautiful. Dr. Duffy, what do you have to say about that? I love that, first of all. Um, and I suppose if I um, had advice for parents, we sometimes get so stuck in the moment, what's happening right now that we, forget that what we're nurturing with our kids in part is not just a relationship with them that works right now while they're 11 or 15 or 17, but when they're 30 or 40. And so the more we put into the bank account now, the more connected we are, um, the more we follow Kara's uh, advice and you know really allow them to be who they are the better off we're going to be, the more connected we're going to be for a lifetime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, 17 pages of notes. That's what you gave me tonight, okay? My, my arm is now numb, but I loved every minute of it. Thank you both so much. And it's so kind of you that we can share this. And if people want to do a deeper dive into puberty itself from your noon talk, uh, just what a pleasure. Thank you. You'll find all of this on the Glenbar GPS uh, um, website, uh, our YouTube channel, go there, lots of takeaways. Can't wait to have you back already. And we just say goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kara. Thank you, John. Take care. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Be safe. And we can go. Oh, that's wonderful, Kara. Just wonderful. Um, um, so much to think about and so many notes to explore later. Thank you so much about that. A beautiful background, a beautiful understanding of why they are who they are. Um, talk a little bit about um, how COVID specifically changed what we've talked about today. Well, I mean, I think it, it, you would have to have your head in the sand to not have read some of the data about the mental health impacts of COVID. So what we know is in, in a pubescent body and brain, the limbic system lights up with peers. That should be proof positive to us. The peer influence, friends and acquaintances is massively important in terms of brain development and social and emotional development. And many kids did not have a typical path through peer connection for most of the past two years. Um, I am based in Los Angeles. My children were online for school for 16 months. Uh, it, it was extraordinarily difficult in California. And when kids could connect in person, they were doing it essentially against the rules, right? And so they were in, they were in conflict there. 
everyone had a different experience through COVID. Some mm -hmm. people had lost, some people had struggled, some people had profound isolation, and some people didn't have any of those things. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to generalize and say that COVID did this or COVID did that. But what we do know is it for sure deeply fractured these, these social connections and kids are only now starting to rebuild them. And we are seeing, you, know, you start listening to what teachers have to say about what life is like in the classroom or in school and, and we see the impacts, but I think they are healable. Uh, and and I, I think having recognized what happened here, what we have come to learn is um, in the next pandemic, hopefully it's a long way off, but in the next pandemic, there are certain things that, that simply cannot happen. We have to figure out how to lean into connection. And thank goodness, I mean, pediatricians never thought they would say thank goodness for social media. Thank goodness for social media. Thank goodness for screens. We used to only say negative things about them. They were a savior for so many kids. Right, right. What a shift. What a shift. Um, uh, Melissa, I know you have a question. Thanks, Gilda. Maybe more of just a, I think, a comment of no matter how many times you hear this after surviving it or navigating it um, years ago with my own kids, just how spot on. And I think when you're approaching that with your own kids, it, you know, it, it, it's kind of like hard to believe or what it's going to look like, you know, until you find yourself in it. And so, it, you know, hopefully it's helpful for people to hear, you know, from those of us who have actually navigated with this, with their, this, with their kids, you know, how spot on this is. Thank you. So, you know, you've talked about all the things that we can expect uh, the normal uh, behavior um, and the difficulty of knowing when anger is depression. And so when, when do I seek help? Yeah. Um, most common question we have always gotten is that question. Um, that question is 20 times more common today than it was before COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is there are some phenomenal resources out there that can help you distinguish. But at the end of the day, if your internal flags are going up and you are worried about your kid, get help, get an assessment. Connecting with a mental health expert is never a bad idea. And it was stigmatized for a long time, but I think people coming out of pandemic especially have a new appreciation for the value of assessing mental health status and caring for mental health. So it, it, let's say you're worried about your child and you know he or she is slamming a door and moody with you and angry, and, but they're doing fine in school and they still have friends and everything else in their life seems to be going well and you don't know, do I take them to it? No harm in connecting with a mental health expert, whether that's someone based at your school, whether it's someone that your healthcare provider, your pediatrician or family care provider sends you to, uh, whether it's their incredible resources in the community and have a conversation with them and they can help you tease apart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a question here in the chat. Any specific tips for parents of a child with special needs? Yeah, it's another really, really common question that I get. I think kids with special needs uh, were the most alienated in COVID. Um, because, and it depends what their needs are and were, but by and large, um, it, it became incredibly difficult to access services for kids who had needs. Um, and teachers were so strapped, teachers' aides were so strapped um, that it, it, it was like that group was the very first group to get uniformly hit with um, cuts across the board. And so um, I, my strongest recommendation there is for families who have kids with special needs, start, um, if you haven't already, start accessing uh, programs that are available and back on, whether they're online or in person, and many of them are available in person, um, in order to be able to resume whatever care was, was needed before, whether it's mental health care, physical care. And then um, let's, let's start advocating for yes. kids with special needs to never be put in that position again. And again, we, we know another pandemic is gonna come, whether it's 10 years or hundred years away, I don't know, but let's start advocating for those kids and those families 
to have safeguards put in place in the same way we need to advocate for kids who go to a typical traditional school to have safeguards put in place because it is not okay for any child's needs to go unmet. And particularly kids with special needs, we know when early intervention is stopped, that it takes so much longer to make up that ground. And so I think it's incumbent upon all of us to not only look at the big picture for children who don't have special needs, but to double down for children who do. Question. You, you've written about girls, you've written about boys. Can you tell us one thing that as a mother of a boy, a mother of a girl, one thing that, that will guide us through this, through this particular area? Um, I will say that I don't think my kids are particularly different because of their genders. I think my kids are different because they are who they are when they came out. Um, I've met a lot of babies minute one of life, and I'm telling you, they are who they are. It's personality and temperament is an incredible thing. Um, I do think hormones are very strong drugs. And so I have certainly seen the impact of estrogen in one brain and testosterone in another. And the way that I relate to those kids based upon which hormone is dominating in their body is a little bit different. But I think the vast majority of what makes my parenting style different with my two kids has to do with who my kids are as people and how they problem solve and how they relate and what type of communication works for them. And frankly, I think birth order has a lot to do with it as well. Um, I'm a big believer in the first pancake rule. I always apologize to my daughter for that. The first pancake rule being, you know, the, per the first pancake is always the one that's messed up. And I always say to her, I'm so sorry you're my first pancake because I really got this wrong. But I, I will say that it is my, uh, I, I question a lot of my own parenting strategies because I do this all day, every day. But the one strategy I never question is telling my kids when I've messed it up and yeah and then taking a do-over with them. That's beautiful. That, that's a good way to close. I know, Melissa, you joined me in saying thank you to everyone who was able to listen today. Uh, lots to learn, come back again. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Take care.